So a lot of the decoupling stuff, as you'll remember, um, particularly rhetorically, has now faded. And it's because the, the, the wishes, if you will, or the hopes of the decouplers uh, just simply could not be materialised without significant economic costs on their own communities. So we've shifted register to this idea of de-risking, whatever that means. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal, and today I'm talking to a colleague in Australia. I'm talking to Warwick Powell, who is an adjunct professor at Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, and he's also a senior fellow at the Taihe Institute, a non-governmental international think tank based in Beijing. Warwick does research at the intersection of global supply chains, international geopolitical economy, and contemporary technology, including blockchains and digital currencies. We have been exchanging emails for a while, but we haven't had a chance to talk yet, which is what we're going to change today and discuss China in the global physical and digital economy. Warwick, welcome to the show. Look, it's great to finally meet face to face, so to speak, Pascal. I've been a great fan. Thank you very much for that. So, and we've been discussing a little bit, especially whenever I put something out on on China. And the the question to me today, also like looking at your at your expertise, is um, after all the sanctions of, especially chip imports, but also Chinese exports to U.S. markets, and the sanctions on uh, what we just learned now, TikTok, um, you know, all of these economic coercion that has been going on against China, uh, and uh, after uh, Janet Yellen's famous, infamous visit uh, recently where she asked China to stop overproduction, whatever that is supposed to mean. Uh, where do you see China's economy today in the spring of 2024 and China as a political, you know, political uh, economy? Look, China's a big country that has been going through decades and decades of economic development and transformation with one cornerstone objective in mind, and that is to raise the living standards of 1.4 billion people. Now, to do that from a position of extreme poverty off the back of 100 years or so of um, warfare is a very, very big undertaking. So China today has been quite successful in ultimately achieving um, its first objective, which is to raise the living standards of a lot of people. But nothing stands still. And this is the thing to remember about economic systems and social systems. And the Chinese body politic, if you will, has been one that is continually in motion. And right now, over particularly the course of the last five or six years, we've been witness to another big structural transformation that is taking place. So, and what is the what is the essence of that structural transformation then? The structural transformation is focused on moving from an economic model that has been underpinned by particularly rapid expansion in the urbanization world, apartments, property, and urbanization related infrastructure, electricity, water systems, roads, transportation, to one that is now more focused on the role of, I guess, what you'd broadly describe as smart technology-driven economic activities, ranging from manufacturing to AI-driven service delivery and those sorts of things. So that's the transition that's taking place. We're going from a world that has been strongly focused on the physical elements of urbanisation and the investment in fixed capital formation to a world where we're looking to transform the productivity base of an economy to raise living standards once again. The Much of the past 30, 40 years in China, the economic model was to a good extent built also upon um, exports, right? China was at some point a bit of a sweatshop of the world and then like a place where, where cheap electronics could be produced after Japan had, had moved on. And we've seen in China a similar development as also in, in, in other uh, Asian tigers that they that they go up <clears throat> the, the, the ladder and then transform from an export-driven economy to a consumer-led economy, domestic consumers. And the Chinese consumer market is huge and is important. Is that still going on, this transition from 
uh, going from exports to to lo to local consumers, or am, am I misunderstanding this? Look, very much so, Pascal. And in fact, that transition or the tipping point was about a decade ago. So mm -hmm. back in 1995 or thereabouts, the proportion of Chinese manufactured outputs that were exported was in the order of 11%. And by 2004, that had reached 18%. So almost one in five um, you know, units of value, if you will, of Chinese manufactured outputs was being exported in 2004. Ever since then, however, mm -hmm. that has been tapering back um, and now it's sitting at about 13%. What that means is, put it the other way, 87% of Chinese manufactured outputs is actually consumed by the domestic economy, which tells us something because outputs have been rising, as we know, but because 87% is being absorbed domestically, it also tells us that domestic consumption, um, both at an enterprise level and at a household level, has also been rising at the same time. So the transition has already been taking place really for the past 10, uh, 20 years. Since 2004, um, the transition has been towards an economy that is once again predominantly domestic oriented with an export focus of somewhere in the region of 13% of manufactured outputs. Yeah, and some of China's um, best technology is today being exported to third party markets if we take like the US and China as the two main rivals on the on the world economic stage and these third markets like I visited Thailand recently and I was just flabbergasted by the number of BYD cars um, driving around they're beautiful cars awesome cars and that seems to be something that irks the United States and and Miss Yellen saying Mrs. Yellen saying like uh, China you have to curb your overproduction which is a really really strange term because like uh, every country exports as much as it likes on on not just as much as it likes it's like the companies try to export as much as they can or or get rent right as much as they can so if there's an if there's export going on you would you would uh, you would think that there's demand that wants it. Now, do you see that this that there's a structural change also going on in this in this in the way of 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 how the United States is thinking about world trade? Look, there certainly is. The United States has been particularly anxious over the last six or seven years in relation to its trade deficit, and ever since the Trump tariffs has sought to at least politically address that. Now, some recent research from David Orta and some of his associates actually uh, demonstrates that the Trump tariffs haven't actually delivered any material outcomes as far as employment replacement is concerned domestically in the United States, though it has delivered a political dividend. So the strategy so far, which is an attempt to um, hold back, if you will, Chinese exports into the United States as a foundation point for the rejuvenation of American manufacturing hasn't really materialized. So that's the first point. The second point to bear in mind is that the patterns or contours of global trade or value circulation in the world has been undergoing significant change again over the last 10 to 15 years. And what that has seen is other countries other than the United States and the European Union markets, the traditional markets for manufactured goods, um, have been now um, coming on board and uh, occupying increasingly large shares of trade relationships with China and others. So the patterns of global trade and economic circulation are also changing. So there's a few things going on here. Um, from a geopolitical and a geopolitical economy point of view that I think is causing a, a crystallisation, if you will, of concerns in the traditional dominant markets or bodies politic about where the world's heading. And, um, and so it, it is understandable. I often describe this as um, the emergence of a form of displacement anxiety so, you know, from a position where uh, the uh, transatlantic economies occupied the natural centre point of a global economic system, um, they are now being redistributed as part of a more decentralised network. And that's 
an experience that many in the transatlantic worlds find very discomforting. Yeah, and that they are actually trying to do something against. And, you know, the this is an old story, actually. You know, if you if we go back 200 years, 150 years, the Chinese China as a market has always been hugely important, right? I mean, there were the Western powers fought two wars uh, with China over the right to sell opium <laughs> inside of China, which is that's that's how important this China also is as a market. And that 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 balance, uh, there was there was always a question of 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 balance and who gets to import and export what. Now, uh, China currently is of course in a completely different position from the from this weak state where it was 150 years ago. Um, do you think that this is now leading to rather more re um, more equal relationship between them, or? Is there is there a danger that we are that we are going toward these like very fragmented trade blocks that we've seen in the in the Cold War? But to me, at the moment, at least, we are not in the fragmented world yet. Disentangling a lot of these global supply chains is actually easier said than done. The mm -hmm. current kinds of entanglements that exist, where products are being assembled through. The, the bringing together the manufactured goods of, from many countries um, has been optimised, if you will, over the course of the last 30 to 40 years to achieve low costs, um, high efficiencies and those sorts of things. The other thing to bear in mind is that these complex manufacturers in particular also depend upon the development of ecosystems that have the right kinds of skills um, amongst the workforce to be able to sustain them. And those sorts of skills are not things that can be manufactured with the click of a finger. So competent, highly skilled workers, together with an ecosystem that enables optimised supply chain flows, is something that takes time to fine tune and it certainly isn't an easy one to untangle. So that's the first thing to remember. So a lot of the decoupling stuff, as you'll remember, um, particularly rhetorically, has now faded. And it's because the, the, the wishes, if you will, or the hopes of the decouplers uh, just simply could not be materialised without significant economic costs on their own communities. So we've shifted register to this idea of de-risking, whatever that means. Um, the the other thing to sort of bear in mind as these global contours change is that just as China has emerged over the last 30 years as really the world's only manufacturing superpower with hmm. 29 to 30% of global manufacturing value added and 35% of gross output, it's also now starting to take its capabilities through its firms into other markets through investments, either directly in creating new factories or in joint ventures. And we're seeing that in the EV sector, for example, as well as in other arenas. In the EV sector, BYD is establishing factories in Hungary, Thailand, Malaysia, Brazil, Mexico. The Italian government has reached out inviting BYD to set up shop in Italy. Um, Cherry has uh, just signed a, a, a joint venture deal um, in Spain to uh, take over an old Nissan factory in Barcelona as part of a joint venture with a Spanish company to refurbish that and begin manufacturing EVs in, in Spain for the European market. So the recycling, if you will, of these trade surpluses through capital investments in the developing world is actually a great way in which these new patterns of circulation are driving economic development, skills development, capability development in all of these markets, not just in um, in in the global centres, if you will. But how how high is the risk that politics will will interfere further? I mean, we've seen the attempt by the United States and the and the European Union, for instance, to completely shut Huawei off the the market right especially in the 5g and so on i mean there's there's this whole <laughs> i mean there's always national security dialogue i mean this is going to threaten our national security whether it does or not 
And we see much less Chinese products in the Europe and the US than we see, for instance, in Southeast Asia, which really imports a lot of Chinese goods. And, 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 and then we have like different ecosystems uh, at work. Is, do you see the risk that this could happen to the EV market, for instance, as well, that suddenly a crackdown against BYD starts happening and, and the, the, these more protectionist policies sold through a security uh, uh, reasoning will will take over there as well. Yeah, I think that there's two issues here, Pascal. One is whether or not we're dealing with products manufactured in China being exported in, into, say, the European mm -hmm. market, or whether they're products being manufactured by Chinese firms in Europe. Um, now, mm -hmm. uh, whether or not uh, tariffs and those sorts of things are ultimately imposed, I guess, is going to be a matter that will be subject to a lot of political consideration by the European Union and by its member states. Whether that then extends to discriminatory um, policy provisions against Chinese-owned firms that are actually located in and operating facilities inside the European Union, that's going to be another bridge to cross. You know, So these two, two dimensions, if you will, of dealing with foreign capital and foreign production capabilities, is, you know, they, they do drive, I think, very different political calculations. One of the concerns that many in the political elite, if you will, have is the trade balances ultimately reflects in the hollowing out of manufacturing capacity in their own countries. Now, if that's actually counterbalanced by new capital coming in with know-how and technologies to build new factories and run new factories, well, in many ways, the foundational hollowing out concerns are overcome. This then raises the question of whether or not you're willing to accept that the owners of this capital capacity are foreign and specifically Chinese. Now, the Spanish example tells us that JVs can be done. Um, so, look, there's many ways to skin the cat. And I think that the policy options available... Um, largely boil down to, I think, four main things. One is, of course, to just ban outright um, imported goods. There are consequences to that, namely higher costs and reduced living standards. The second one is to invest in domestic capacity yourself to build up local firms and get them to a point where they are competitive again. That's a tall order. And a lot of local firms and local investors are really reluctant to go down what is a high risk, high capital path. Um, the third one um, is to engage in uh, joint ventures um, and find ways of harnessing the strengths, if you will, of the different parties involved. And the fourth way is just to leave the market totally open. Now, I doubt that in today's political climate, the choices will be the last one. There won't be, or the, or the probability that the market will be really left open for foreign capital or foreign imports is it, it, untouched is, is unlikely. So we're, In the West, yeah. We're, so we're going to come down to those first three. Where, 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 where does the body politic land in terms of those first three policy options? Will it ban things outright? Will it seek to invest in local firms and capacity? Or will it start to look for creative and imaginative win-win solutions? I hope, for the sake of all concerned, that the third option gets more attention and more thinking power, um, because it will require a lot more mediation and negotiation and all of those things. The first two options are... Uh, uh, the first option, banning, doesn't help anybody, actually. The second option is unlikely because I can't see European or American governments ultimately really footing the bill. So, you know, these are choices that are being that, that are on the menu today, if you will, and bodies politic will need to think through those. And as you said, you know, it might not even be possible to completely um ban all the things that you that you're not happy about because they're already integral parts of the ecosystems that you build and uh, you know the thing is if you have an iPhone and then the the, the thing is okay it's made in uh, designed in California, uh, assembled in China, right? And it's somehow it seems to be extremely difficult to 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 take that apart because there are there is certain know-hows and certain certain technologies that only can be jointly developed. At least it seems to me 
because otherwise we would see Apple and these companies try to dissociate themselves as strong as possible from China, but they don't. They actually have meetings even with very top government officials to discuss uh, um, economic development and and supply chains, especially supply chains. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit what that one hinges on? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll touch on the Huawei stuff in a moment. But the other point that I think is worth mm. bearing in mind uh, is that the, the there are sort of downstream catalytic implications too for how nations go about mediating the relationship with foreign capital and and technologies and the issue around solar and wind technologies is a great example because uh, the the ambitions to shift to a low carbon energy footprint are best achieved if you can do it in the least cost, most time efficient way. And that of course is by more than likely by importing hardware manufactured in China. Now, once you've done that, there are downstream catalytic possibilities and implications. Autonomous energy or energy independence by controlling and owning your own resources to harness the power of nature transforms your economic independence, number one, but it also transforms the economic cost structure of industries, which opens up new possibilities for downstream uh, activities to emerge and take place and enables another round, if you will, of entrepreneurial innovation to drive economic development in these mature industries and mature markets. So I think it's important to bear in mind that um, not all capitals are equivalent. The first thing to understand is that different kinds of things have different possibilities and implications. EVs will create an ecosystem of highly skilled people, engineers, testing engineers, designers, and those sorts of things. Um, the, the PV environment will actually um, create a general um, reduction in your cost of energy, which is transformative in a, in, in a social body as a whole. On the Huawei stuff, the there's no doubt that there has been a whole bunch of unintended consequences of the moves to um, ban Huawei from rolling out 5G infrastructure in different markets and more broadly to impose um, a range of, to, to, to implement what I often call the full court press to try to prohibit technologies being sold into the China marketplace, particularly the high-end semiconductor chip technologies. And the, and the unintended consequences um, have been, for instance, a reduction in service quality standards where Huawei has been, in a sense, pushed out. And a recent report I read um, that benchmarked 5G standards across Europe and the UK found that London sat at the bottom of the list. And one of the reasons identified by the report authors um, was, was directly linked to the decision in 2020 by the UK government to force telecommunications companies in the UK to replace the Huawei 5G technologies with other technologies. So a diminution of quality standards in, in your telecommunications infrastructure, reducing economic competitiveness is first round effect. The second round effect on these enterprises, of course, is that they're having to spend capital replacing equipment that they spent capital on not that long ago. That's not what you'd call efficient use of resources at all. Significant capital has therefore gone to waste. They haven't got the return on their original investment, but they're having to replace it. So the rip and replace stuff has impacted enterprises adversely, and it's impacted the users of technologies as well. The third round impact, if you will, has been that inadvertently it's capitalized a reaction from the Chinese government and industry to develop their own or fast track the development of their own semiconductor capabilities. And if it wasn't for a lot of the sanctions on Huawei, it's actually highly unlikely that Huawei would have ultimately backed a number of startup companies in China uh, that have become quite mm -hmm. crucial in that entire ecosystem build in China. So that's the third round impact. And the fourth round impact actually goes to a potential transformation of the 
technology business model globally because Huawei itself, and it's not the only company in China, has been very active in the development of open source technologies for its cloud, its AI, um, and a range of its other application environments. And these open source technologies, and Huawei's got a repository on GitHub with 105 um, repositories already, um, lower the costs for developers to develop their own applications within these operating systems and reduces, therefore, the barriers for new applications to be developed. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because it fundamentally turns on its head the IP rent-based business model that has underpinned Western or American big tech. So this is what people like um, Varoufakis would describe as um, techno-feudalism, right? So techno-feudalism is the idea that uh, control over these technical platforms in effect enables the owners of the platforms to behave like landlords and collect monopoly rents. The expansion and application of open source technologies driven by big ecosystems such as Huawei is actually going to create alternative pathways for technology development. So on four fronts, we've seen the unleashing, if you will, of unintended consequences that are likely to have very adverse consequences for the incumbent firms. This is this is autoimmunity at work. It's autoimmunity that in the name of protecting something is actually destroying it. 